we've been studying the Messianic Psalms, uh, which point to Jesus coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, it's really the appropriate thing to be studying when you look at a new year ahead of us uh, because we live in a very sinful planet. According to Ephesians 2, the, the devil uh, owns this place currently, but his time is limited. And uh, these Messianic Psalms point to the, the Messiah that's coming uh, who will uh, depose the devil and establish his, his kingdom of righteousness. And that is the hope that we have. And hence, we've been talking about uh, not being feared up, but faithed up, especially when we look at the climate of the world around us. Uh, the scriptures uh, give us uh, ample information as to where history is going. To really understand Psalm 110, uh, you have to look elsewhere to uh, understand the magnitude of it. And uh, to understand the magnitude of the, the, the prophecy of the Messiah to coming as the king, you have to understand what's going to happen at the end of time according to God's timing of things. And to do that, we have to turn to the book of Revelation uh, momentarily to just get an idea of where things are going uh, and then to understand just the true import of Psalm 110. And so in, in doing the analogy of faith to take one scriptural passage and uh, look at other passages to understand it and to illuminate it, Revelation 13 does that for us. Revelation chapter 13 uh, tells us that history is going to culminate from a, uh, a human perspective uh, with a kingdom that will not be the kingdom of the Lord. It will be the kingdom of the Antichrist. Uh, and that kingdom will be man's final kingdom. Uh, and it gives us these words about that kingdom. It talks about the world at that time and the word they. It says they, the world, at that time will worship the dragon, which is a code word for the devil. They'll worship uh, the dragon uh, who, because it says that he gave uh, his authority to the beast, which will be the Antichrist the final world ruler. And they worship the beast. Again, it says it now twice, uh, saying, here's their mocking tones before God's throne. Who is like the beast who's able to make and, and, and wage war against him? Uh, their answer to the rhetorical question is, uh, nobody. It says there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, meaning anything that's holy and sacred and true and moral, he'll trash it. So it says he'll have the authority to act for 42 months was given to him. That will come from God. God has the final world ruler on a short leash. It says, and he opened his mouth in his blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. He doesn't even care about the angelic powers. He'll mock them too. It says it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on earth will, for the third time, do what? They'll worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. You're either in God's Lamb's book of life or you're not. How do you get your name in the Lamb's book of life, the book of all books? Well, you trust Christ as Savior and Lord. The day that you write, you trust Christ as Savior and, your, and Lord, your name is written in that book. And on Judgment Day, they alphabetize that and look for your name. I just read the scriptures, move forward to chapter 20 of Revelation. But that's another sermon in and of itself. Here we want to focus on uh, the political systems of the world. Uh, since man fell in the Garden of Eden, they're under the domination of Satan. His goal is to draw all worship unto himself. But we as Christians are commanded by the Lord to pray in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. See, we're called and commanded to pray for the kingdom to come. What, what kingdom is that? Well, that would be the Davidic Empire as, as prophesied and promised to the, the saints of old that that kingdom would come to earth. It hasn't come yet. It hasn't materialized as the prophets prophesied. So what's the devil doing? Well, he's working overtime to keep that king and kingdom from coming. Guess what? He's not going to stop it, but he's going to give it his best shot. He's going to take a, 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 a satanically inspired man, prop him up as the ruler of all rulers. Uh, he will be the uh, leader of all leaders, the ultimate politician. And the world will think, because of the illusion, will be strong in that day, that he is the, the essence of peace, and he will usher in peace. But he will not usher in utopia, he'll usher in dystopia, the opposite of what is promised. He will be a combination, as you study the book of Revelation, if you study chapters 17 and 18, that coming one will take a political power and wed it to religious power, uh, and will form what Revelation uh, discloses us to us, uh, is the satanic trinity composed of Satan, the dragon, the beast, the antichrist, and the false prophet who does signs and wonders. See, Satan can't do anything uh, uh, creative. He has limited abilities. And so when he tries to set up the, the ultimate world empire, he does it based upon a Trinitarian concept. Don't you find that kind of amusing? That's what he does. But he knows his time is short, 
And so he's trying to get the world to worship him through that trinity. But God knows uh, your day's numbered. Down at this time, it's going to be 42 months, and then it's over for you. And what happens when that kingdom is over? Well, Psalm 110 is going to tell us that the Lord is going to take that, that false worship structure at the end of time and completely destroy it. And when he destroys it, he's going to replace it with his kingdom. That's what's coming. So what do we see now? We see the birth pains of the world leading up to the coming of the Messiah. You know, when the, the woman goes into travail and is going to be having the child, it's a painful thing, is it not? If you're a lady, I'm sure man can't relate. Every pain I've ever had that I relate to that, my wife says, doesn't come close. I, I never can get close. But, it, but you know that when you're having birth pains, the baby's coming. And so Jesus is going to talk about this in Matthew 24 and 25, that what you see in the world today, the darkness that seems to be overpowering the, the light, is merely a prelude to the baby's coming. What's the baby to be born? The kingdom of the Messiah is coming. But it's going to get very painful before the king comes. Psalm 110 is telling you this king is coming. So be not feared up, be faithed up. That's the premise. Be faithed up. Not, don't be feared up. Now, we can read eschatology all day long and understand what is yet to come, and that helps us understand the world about us, but sometimes when you study eschatology, the end times, you get fearful. You get frightened, but God doesn't want you to get fearful. He wants you to be faithful and to, and to be strong and courageous in dark days, waiting for the king to appear. That's what Psalm 110 is about, one of the greatest messianic psalms. By way of review, it's going to give us uh, two reasons, two simple reasons as to why you should uh, have great faith in dark times. Number one, because the king comes. That's a review of last week. Th those are the first three verses. That God has promised that he's going to bring the Davidic king, Jesus, to set up on the throne of David, as he promised, and it's going to happen, and there's nothing that the devil can do to stop it. The king is coming. Do you believe it? Revelation uh, chapter 22, verse 20. When John gets to the very end of his book, he's just explained the entire destruction of the world, false systems, and the coming of the Messiah in chapter 19. He gets to chapter 22, verse 20. He's probably tired out, overcome with the emotion of seeing all of the sin judged, the devil uh, put away, and, and God's kingdom come. And he gets to verse 20 of chapter 22, and he says this, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. What saint cannot look at that and go, oh yeah, Lord, I, I echo that prayer. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. What greater thing could you pray, pray at the beginning of 2014 than that? Amen, Lord, let it be so that your kingdom's coming. Come. Come now. That's the summation of his prayer. The reason why you should be uh, faith up, not feared up, well, it's because the king is coming. Do you believe it? The second reason, which we're going to look at today, only two points. Second reason is be faith up because the priest is coming. Now, the Jews understood this concept uh, and from reading the, the Old Testament text and their mind kind of checked out on some of the text because it prophesied a king coming and it prophesied a priest coming. So what did they think? Two. Two are coming. Well, they didn't quite understand the scriptures. Now we understand the priest and the king were going to be one, but they didn't get it at the day and time. So in this prophecy, he's telling them who's coming and how that role is going to be highly unique. Look at verse 4. Why should you have great faith in the days in which we live. It says the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. I would put to you, if God swears and makes an oath, guess what? It's going to happen. Now, if a car salesman makes an oath to you, <laughs> etc. See, God has sworn and he will not change his mind. But what did God swear? Well, before we look at what God swore, we want to look at the word swear for just a minute. The word swear in Hebrew is shava. Shava, as I was reading this this week, because I do my translation work before I I, you know, do anything. I was reading that and I was like, whoa, that's an interesting word because it's the Hebrew word for seven. So it really reads in Greek, the Lord has seven. Huh? Why did they throw that word in there? Because number seven is what? Perfect number. It's God's number. Number six is man's number because man was created on the sixth day. God rests on the seventh. Seven's always been God's number of perfection. So what the Jews did is they took that number seven, the number of God, and they related it to oaths. And that number became an oath term denoting God's perfection. So if you make an oath with somebody, you're telling them, I believe that the God who is all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-perfect is watching us take this oath. Now, if it's God giving the oath, he's telling you, my oath is the essence of perfection. There's no imperfection about it whatsoever. Therefore, God can say, I can swear and not change my mind. I won't think about later and think, you know, I should have never promised a Davidic empire to anybody on earth, ever. 
that was a mistake. See, we'll never say that because he has perfection about his promises. Here's what he promised specifically to the king that we just talked about in verses 1 to 3. He says, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter the kings in his day of wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He'll shatter the chief men over a broad country. And then he ends this great messianic psalm with a very strange verse. You ever read Bible verses and kind of scratch your head wondering, what's that one about? Nobody here can feel my pain? Yeah. Verse 7 is one of those ones you want to have a Bible answer man dial number on your speed dial. What does that mean? It says he, this Messiah type, will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head, and then it finishes. One of the greatest messianic uh, prophecies in the, in the book of Psalms ends with this messianic type by a brook getting a drink. What is that all about? We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But the reason why you should be totally faithed up and not feared up is not just because the king is coming, but because the priest is coming. This passage is going to tell you three things about the priest. Three simple things. Number one, it's going to identify his person, the person of the priest. Who is he? Well, God, L-O-R-D, capitalized, that always references Yahweh, the eternal God, the God of the burning bush. The God of the burning bush uh, has sworn that uh, he will make this priest a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Well, there's a word that you don't use every day. It's a combination of two words in Hebrew. Melech, which means king. Sadiq, which means righteousness. Or if you put the two words together, it's king of righteousness. Well, who is he? Who is this person, this priest that's coming? Now imagine the psalmist is changing gears here. He's talked about a king who's coming. Now he's saying that king is going to be like a priest, like after Melchizedek, that priest. Melchizedek uh, is kind of a, a strange figure that just pops up on the biblical uh, scene in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham uh, rescues Lot uh, from uh, forces uh, that, that kidnapped him. And as he's passing his way after victory uh, near uh, um, the city of Salem, which the city of peace, which became the city of Jerusalem, uh, he runs into a priest. That priest's name, Melchizedek. Who's, who's he? He's a king priest. He's not just a high priest. He's also a high priest who happens to be a king. Don't you find it interesting that when God wants to prepare our thinking for his son's arrival, way back in the times of Abraham, thousands of years before the birth of Messiah, he drops a king out of nowhere who's king and priest onto the world scene to be a foreview of the one who is to come. God's so intricate in things. Nothing happens by accident. Who is this uh, Melchizedek that Abraham paid tithes to? And he did. In fact, a lot of people get their giving to God 10% from this biblical context, although it doesn't talk about giving God 10% in this passage from tithing perspective. It just happened to be what Abraham did on that day. Um, and so from this mysterious stranger from the Old Testament, we only learn who he is, how he functions by going elsewhere in Scripture. Now, for interpretation purposes, this is called the analogy of the faith. I can't understand some biblical passages unless I go other places that reference that passage. You follow? So I can't just stay in Psalm 110 to talk about Psalm 110. I have to go elsewhere to understand it. So I have to go to Genesis to see who's Melchizedek. I have to go to the book of Hebrews to understand what it says about Melchizedek because it gives you the fulfillment of Melchizedek in chapter 7. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, ancient Jerusalem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham also apportioned a tenth part of all of his spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, called King of Righteousness. And then so also King of Salem, and, and then he translates that for you, if you don't read Greek. Uh, that's king, the city's name is Peace. Uh, who is he? Well, he says he's without what? Father. Doesn't it appear to have a mother? We don't have his genealogy. We can't trace his genealogical list. We don't know who his parents were. Having neither a beginning of days nor end of life, but he, this priest, is made like, metaphorically, the son of God. He remains a peace, priest perpetually. Remember, the Davidic king has to rule and reign on David's throne when he comes forever. Who could only do that but Jesus, the forever one? Now, all of a sudden, the priest is going to come rule and reign. He has to be eternal by nature as well. But his priesthood is way bigger than Aaron's priesthood. His priesthood predates Aaron's priesthood. It goes all the way back to Melchizedek's priesthood. See, Aaron's priesthood had death all about it. 
and the, the concept that it would be removed one day, as we're going to see. Melchizedek's, from, we read in Hebrews 7, was a forever type of thing. Jews were great on keeping list of things. Uh, if you want to read uh, the books like uh, Chronicles or Numbers, you'll find huge genealogical lists that when you're reading through the Bible in a year, you're cranking along through Genesis and excited and everything, then you run into those great genealogical chapters and what happens to your Bible reading program? <laughs> kind of stops, doesn't it? It's like, oh, I've got to wait for this? You gotta, i got to read this? See, they want to be able to validate everything. So when it came down to a high priest, they want to identify the person of the priest by genealogical list. Is, is he... Is he a pure priest from the line of Aaron? When it comes down to the Melchizedekian priesthood, of which Jesus is, can't trace it. Why? Because God says, I want this priesthood to have eternality about it. You can't find out who his mother is. You can't find out who his dad is. There's no genealogicalist. Why? Because it says, he is like unto the Son of Man. He pointed forward to the Son, the Messiah, who would come, who will truly be the eternal one. Again, why should you be faithed up? Well, because the priest is coming, and this person of the priest is the eternal priest. Not a temporary priest. He's an eternal priest. Hebrews uh, chapter 7, verse 14, goes on to say, For it is evident that our Lord was descended from uh, what tribe? Well, tribe of Judah, through which the king of kings would come. A tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests, translated, Moses never said priests were coming from the line of Judah. And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is attested of him, he says in Hebrews 7, quoting Psalm 110 again, you are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Who was that? That was Jesus, the eternal one that replaced the temporary nature of Aaron's line. See, the king that is coming won't just be a king, with regal power, he'll be a king who's priestly in everything about a priest of holiness and righteousness. That's why he can bring the perfect empire to earth. He has pure political power that's pure and holy, but his person is the priesthood about him. Point is well taken. Christ is the eternal God who fits the role of the Melchizedekian priesthood. Verse 18 of chapter 7 says, For on the one hand, uh, there is a setting aside of the former commandment because of its weaknesses and its uselessness. The old Mosaic code was temporary. For the law made nothing perfect, he says. And on the other hand, there's the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Better hope is going to be the work of Christ. It says, and inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for indeed they, the Old Testament priests, became so without an oath, but he uh, with an oath through the one who had said to him, quoting again from Psalm 110, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You, the Messiah, are the priest forever. They never promised an Aaronic priest he'd be a priest forever. They were temporary. One could come from the throne of God that would be the son of God who would be the ultimate priest. What's his job? Well, we know what his person is, but he's going to give you some insight as to what his job is in verse 22 of chapter 7. So much more than Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priest, on the one hand, existed in great numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, continues forever. Uh, I turned 56 on Friday. Um, I'm getting older. I still remember who you are. I still remember where I am. At. I know where my car is parked, etc. What's going to happen to me one day? I'm going to die. Do I get replaced? Or do they just say, no, we're not going to hire any other pastors? <laughs> that I'll get replaced, won't I? I mean, I will get replaced. I mean, I'm destined to death. So are you. Uh, and I'll get replaced, so will you. In the Old Testament, every Aaronic priest was replaced. Why? They're physical men who died. What happened in Jesus' priesthood? He came, he died, he rose again. He lives forever. He's the ultimate priest that gives us a better covenant. Now, what it tells us about his covenant is it says, uh, verse 25, therefore he is able, based on this eternal priesthood, to save forever those who draw near to God through him. And you wonder about losing your salvation. What did he just tell you? If he's your high priest, your salvation is secure or not secure. What did he tell you there? His job as your high priest is to save you forever when you draw near to him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Who's the them? Well, that's a believer for you, for me. Why is he having to make intercession as your priest? Because the devil brings accusation in the throne room of God. Read Job chapter 1. 
uh, on a daily basis, on a moment-by-moment basis. The devil brings accusation. That's what his name Satan means. He accuses saints constantly. Accuses Job, accuses you before the throne of God. And when he brings accusation, this great eternal priest, Jesus, steps forward to say, that's my child. Back off. My blood has cleansed them. My spirit indwells in them. They're my child. I'll deal with them. I'll forgive them. I'll restore them. Devil, back off. I don't know about you, but I get great hope looking at this priest uh, to understand that that's Christ. And he's, he secures my salvation and he stands in the gap between me and the old devil and holds him at bay. Question is, how much info do you, or ammunition do you give the devil to keep him busy in the throne room of God? I mean, don't do a whole lot so he can bring accusation. I mean, make it tough like Job did for the devil. But God's telling us through the pen of the, the inspired pen of the writer of Hebrews, when the Messiah, Jesus, came, he fulfilled uh, at the base form what was prophesied of him to come, that he would be a priest that would come and be a king. But to understand that uh, these two roles would be coalesced into one, you have to go to the book of Zechariah again. To understand scripture, what must you do? You have to go look at other scripture. So to understand who this uh, king is this one that is coming, his position as king, his person, what he's all about. You have to go to Zechariah, who talks about him, the high priest who will come. Uh, we read in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8, this interesting prophecy. Uh, now, listen, this is after the Babylonian uh, fall, after Jews have returned to rebuild the temple. Uh, they're not quite building the temple as fast as they should. It's lying dormant. Zerubbabel is trying to get them to move quicker. They won't. And we have this statement about the high priest at the day and time. His name is Joshua, which interestingly enough is the name of Jesus in Hebrew. Joshua, the high priest, he says, that you and your friends, the priest with you, uh, who are sitting in front of you, indeed they are men, but they are just a symbol. A symbol for what? Well, for behold, uh, the prophet says through God's inspiration, I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. In the time of Zechariah, about 518 B.C., about 500 years before the birth of Christ, God tells the high priest at that day and time, you as the high priest are just a symbol of one who's coming. And all the priests with you and after you are merely symbols of the one who's coming. Who's the one coming? My servant, the branch. All throughout the prophets, those two concepts refer to the Messiah Jesus. All throughout the Old Testament. You can read all my notes tomorrow to understand the, the person of that priest who's coming. My servant is what written all through the book of Isaiah concerning the Messiah who would come. The branch uh, denoted throughout the prophets of the branch that would come from the stump of Israel, the J line of Judah. When the Babylonians destroyed the, the, the Davidic Empire, or so it seemed, they knocked the tree of David down. But God says, but from that stump's going to come a, a shoot. If, and I've told you this, and I'll tell you this again. If you do not knock the shoot off the stump in your backyard, what happens? You get another tree. So if you knock the tree down, you got a stump there, don't go in the house and tell your wife, well, we're done with that one. Because the minute it shoots out a little shoot, you're not done with that. What he's telling you is by way of prophecy that that one who's coming, he'll, he'll be the servant of God like no servant ever. And he will be the branch of the Davidic Empire. He will be the shoot that will come out of the stump and, and, and build, become a massive tree that will be the king in the kingdom. But it says here that in this situation that he's going to be the branch, meaning that priest who's coming, of which the high priest is, typifies, it is really a branch from the line of David, meaning he's hinting at he's going to be a king too. Concept unheard of in the Jews. In case they didn't quite get it, sometimes we don't get the Bible at the first pass as I identify who this priest is, we get to Zechariah 6. Zechariah 6, verse 9 says, The word of the Lord also came to me, saying, Take an offering from the exiles from Hildai, Tobijah, Jediah. Go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, where, where they have arrived from Jerusalem. So three men returned from Babylon with a gift. It was gold and silver. He said, Take the silver and the gold and make an ornate crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the high priest. That's totally unheard of. High priest wore turbans. They didn't wear crowns. God says, put this crown you're going to fashion on the head of the high priest. Then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, a man whose name is Branch, i.e. Messiah, for he will branch out from where he is and he'll build the temple of the Lord. 
Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord. He will bear the honor and he will sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne and the council of peace will be between the two offices. What two offices? Priesthood and the king. Remember, Israel had kings and they had priests. They never had anyone who was both of those things. What does Psalm 10, 110 tell us? It tells us when that king comes, based on Zechariah's prophecy, he will be a combination of priest and king all at the same time. What do Islamists want? They want a world religious empire with Sharia law established. A world caliphate, do they not? Based on Quranic studies, etc. Contrary to what the scriptures teach. They want a, a, a religious system ruling the earth. That shall not work. What do statists want? Pick a country that's despotic in nature. What do they want? Absolute state power to rule and to reign. What does God say? That will never be coalesced into a perfect utopian regal environment until the king of kings comes. He'll be the king and the priest rolled into one and he will rule with absolute authority and perfection when that day comes. That's his person. The Jews could read Zechariah chapter 6 and think two were coming, and God merely shows us as we read the New Testament that it wasn't two, it was one, it was Jesus. He was both. That's point number one, the person of the priest. When he comes to establish his kingdom, point number two, how does he do this? Well, look at his power, verse five. It says, the Lord is at your right hand. Uh, he will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He'll judge among the nations. He'll fill them with corpses, shatter the chief men over a broad country. I don't know how you feel about backup, but backup's a great thing. Uh, when... Uh, I was a sheriff chaplain before I came here. Uh, you know, you had to do ride-alongs with police officers and stuff. Um, one of the questions they asked me, because uh, I was only I was the only chaplain for 1,300 officers, they asked me. Uh, we just when they're interviewing me, we just want to know if you're sitting in the car and uh, a, 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 an unruly gang is attacking the police officer, what will you do? As you're sitting in the police car, what do you think my answer was? I'll take pictures with my iPhone. I'll get on the radio, etc. Uh, so I'm, I'm going through all these questions from this police officer, and I said, I, I would probably exit the vehicle and help the officer. Excellent, excellent, excellent. If you want to grab the shotgun, that's good too. But uh, <laughs> that's what they told me. I'm like, oh, yeah, right. Uh, so backup's a good thing, is it not? Backup's a good thing because it gives you power. When it says the king comes, the Messiah comes, he has backup. Who's his backup? The Lord, the Father, is at where? the right hand of the, Jesus, the priest. See, when Jesus comes back to earth to deal with the devil and sin, who's at his right hand when he deals with the nations? The Father's with him, and so's the Spirit. See, it's a Trinitarian concept that's pure, attacking Satan's false Trinitarian concept. I find that really interesting. He comes back and he shatters the kings in his day of wrath, and the day of wrath is coming. The day of wrath against the nations, when they are arrayed against Israel to destroy Israel, that's when the king shows up. This week, uh, well, really yesterday, we were uh, taking all of our Christmas things down. It takes hours, you know, all the things. We're putting everything away, so I got assigned the tree. So I'm taking the tree apart, and all the little, it's hundreds of things around this tree. So I'm going through all the boxes, pulling, putting everything away. I finally worked my way up to the top of the tree, got on the ladder, a two-step ladder when I needed like a six-step ladder because it's a really tall tree. We have a cathedral ceiling. So I'm up on the top step. It's really precarious. I'm reaching the final couple Christmas balls up there. I get one in my hand. I'm stepping down. I slip on the ladder. I start falling down the ladder, and my hand clenches just, you know, yeah. You ever done that? What do you think happened to that ball? It was like an explosion that, uh, that Liz and my daughter heard in another part of the house, me hitting the wood floor, etc. They came in. There was glass everywhere. That thing just exploded, but it, it was kind of amazing how quickly it exploded. It just shattered into thousands of little pieces. Think about Christ when he comes back as the king, priest, the righteous holy king when he appears. He looks at the empires of the earth and all of their armament and powers, and he looks at it, and according to Psalm 2, which we studied initially, he laughs because he can crush them as quickly as I could crush a Christmas ball. Tink! Because that's why it says he shatters them in the day of his wrath. Joel 3 talks about the day when that king shows up and evidences his power. Notice Joel 3. Joel 3 says, proclaim this among the nations. What does God say at the end of time? Well, he tells them, prepare for war. What war? The, between light and darkness. It's the final battle. It says, let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. 
Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I'm a mighty man. Hasten and come, you surrounding nations. Gather yourselves there. Bring down, O Lord, your mighty ones. Let the nations be aroused and come down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of Armageddon. I mean, read on. It says, for they will sit to judge. He, God says, I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations, as prophesied in Psalm 2, Psalm 89, Psalm 110. He's going to judge the nations, their false political systems. It says, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come and tread the winepress, the vat, it's full. He says, for the day of the Lord is near the valley of decision. It says in verse 16, the Lord roars from Zion. Why? Well, he's from the lion from the tribe of Judah. See, there comes the day when all the forces of the world converge upon Israel to the valley of Armageddon. And every military person I've taken there looks at that valley and says this to me when we stand on Mount Carmel. This is an amazing battlefield. Perfectly round, multiple entry points, and it just slo slopes up like a dish around the edges. Perfect for entrance of troops and armament. Such it is. They arrived there that day to wipe out the Israelites, but God all of a sudden in the darkness of moments roars from heaven like a mighty lion. I don't know if you've ever purchased diamonds of great quality, but they'll put them out on black felt and they'll drop them on there. And you can see them glistening in the light. See, that's going to happen at the end of the times because it says that, that God's going to turn down the luminaries in verse 15. The sun and the moon grow dark. The stars lose their brightness. And at that time of great darkness, it's when the diamond of the Lord appears in his glory. To do what? Shatter false political systems. To do what? Establish his. His of peace. Who's the one doing this? Well, it's going to be the priest, Jesus. The king, Jesus. I don't know what will get you excited about what's coming. But he's coming. The king of kings, the priest, is coming. Your priest. If you have a problem with the priest acting in a warlike fashion, you just need to read the Old Testament. Remember the analogy of the faith. What is that about? To understand concepts in one passage, I must go to other concepts and other passages. We've, we find in the book of 2 Kings chapter 11 a story about a wicked woman. Uh, her name is Athaliah. Uh, her husband was a Davidic king. She was the daughter of Jezebel uh, the, of the northern kingdom. She hated the Davidic line, was married into it. When her son Ahaziah dies in battle, she wants to get back at the Davidic line and she wants to be king, queen. So Athaliah, when her son dies in battle, wipes out the entire Davidic line. These are her grandsons. One by one, she eliminates them. They saved one little Davidic child. Remember? God's kingdom, he's sworn, will come. As she's, by div, 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 uh, the devil's intim, uh, uh, intimation, uh, she's trying to wipe out that Davidic line, uh, and, and they snatch up one little boy, Joash, in 2 Kings 11. Uh, the, the wife of the high priest takes him. Her name is Jehoshaphat, uh, and her husband, the high priest's name is Jehoiada. They hide him in the temple for, seven, or for six years. On year seven, God's number of perfection they bring out little Davidic king, uh, Joash. They bring him out, and the high priest arms all the soldiers to overthrow Athaliah. And they overthrow her, and they destroy her empire, and now they have a Davidic king. Why do I tell you that story? It is the perfect story from the Old Testament of a priest, a high priest, guarding the Davidic line, arming his troops to overthrow ultimate evil. See, greater evil is coming in the future, according to the scriptures, but it shall be overthrown by a greater high priest than we find in the Old Testament in Jehoiada. It will be that Jesus himself, Yeshua, shall appear. That's his power, ultimate power, to crush his enemies. And lastly, verse 7, that strange little verse that this thing ends on, says what I think is what I would call the position of the priest, point number three. What's his position? It says, he will drink after all of that uh, by the brook by the wayside, therefore he will lift up his head. What in the world is that talking about? Uh, how can it just end after destroying all the forces of the world that he stops and gets a drink out of a brook? How many think that's the viable viewpoint? You're wrong, by the way, because it's not. That's not what it's talking about. Uh, the word used here uh, points us to uh, uh, water from the Old Testament perspective, which would come from a gihon, a spring. Uh, and one of the major gihons and springs in Jerusalem uh, is, the, is the spring... Uh, 
down by the Kidron Valley. I've been in it many times uh, that Hezekiah used in his day to bring water to Jerusalem. But this particular Gihon spring was the spring that was used in the Old Testament to coronate King Solomon. Why would this King Jesus, why would this priest, high priest Jesus, go down to this spring? Well, because that's where Solomon was coronated as king, the wisest king who ever lived. First Kings chapter 1 says this about his coronation day. So Zadok, the priest, Nathan, the prophet, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites, the Pelethites, went down and had Solomon ride on David, King David's mule, and they brought him to Gihon, to the spring. And the Zadok, the priest, then took the horn of the oil from the tent, and he anointed Solomon. They blew the trumpet, and the people said, Long live King Solomon. What is the position of the priest according to Psalm 110, verse 7? Coronated king. Let's put this in uh, pragmatic terms. When Jesus appears and destroys all the forces of evil, wipes out all evil empires, all those that are arrayed against him, when he's here in, in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning and setting up his kingdom, don't you know there's going to be a coronation day? Don't you know that people were, like, like were extremely uh, reserved in their worship are going to be totally Pentecostal that day? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, their hands are going to be up. Why? Uh, Jesus is right there. He's on his throne. He's building this massive temple according to Ezekiel 40 to 43. He's the ultimate Davidic priest. He's, he's here. Don't you know people are going to be excited? When we're in Israel on Shabbat, which is, uh, starts at sundown on Friday nights, goes to Saturday evening, the holy day, somebody came to me this last trip and they said, man, you, you, you got to come down to Jerusalem to the old city on, a, on Shabbat on Friday evening. I'm like, why? You got to see what's going on there. What goes on there? Well, all of the young people in Jerusalem descend on the temple, like where the wailing wall is. Drums and trumpets and singing and dancing in circles, and they're so excited about the Torah and the law. You just get a flavor of what's it going to be like when they who don't know who Jesus is yet because they've rejected him, what's it going to be like according to uh, Zechariah 12 when they turn to Jesus and they see him singing, laughter, joy, what is verse 7 about? Coronation day. Coronation day. When Jesus is crowned king and evil is put down and peace is on earth and utopia has arrived and it's not going to ever go anywhere, don't you know there will be jubilation? Absolutely there will be. Those little points that we've given you today uh, point you to great times ahead. No matter how dark the days become ahead of us, God's working his plan to bring the great king of kings and lord of lords who happens to be your high priest to earth. And you're going to live to see him if you know him. If you're not a believer today, uh, God's calling you unto himself to say, uh, trust me, a savior, and I'll make you a kingdom member today. I'm excited about 2014 because it's one more year closer to the arrival of the savior, the king and the priest. And may we pray with John, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we look with great anticipation to you fulfilling all of your plan as prophesied through the Messianic Psalms. It's been uh, fun and exciting and encouraging to uh, study these old, these old uh, uh, Psalms and their uh, prophetic content, and we thank you for the hope it gives us, and we pray that we might live like hopeful believers in a world where people uh, don't understand your plan. May we live in such a way we give them hope for the future. And we pray for ourselves as we tithe unto you today. Uh, you are our king and you are our priest. Uh, and you've called for us to be obedient. And we pray that you might find us to be so as we support your kingdom work. Uh, bless our offerings to your great glory in Christ's name. Amen. Lord bless you.